Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your relationship without your man's conscious effort so that you feel desired and taken care of and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today I'm sharing three ways to be a feminine feminist. My guest, Ray, was devastated that her husband was having an emotional affair with a woman from work. She insisted he break it off, and finally, he did. But she wanted her husband to admit what he had done and make it up to her, and he wouldn't. Finally, the texting started again with another woman, and this time, Ray made an ultimatum with the firm conviction that this was unacceptable. What happened next took her on a completely unexpected journey to happily ever after. She's going to walk us through what she did to fix her marriage. Then I'll be giving out the worst relationship advice of the week award, which is truly terrible and unfortunately sent one unsuspecting woman down a hurtful road. All of that is coming up, but first let's talk about three ways to be a feminine feminist. What if you want to be able to have every opportunity to do your life's work and earn what you're worth doing it, but you don't want to be identified as an angry woman who rails against the patriarchy and doesn't shave her armpits? Should you call yourself a feminist? And what if you also want to wear sparkly necklaces and be womanly while you're kicking butt in your career? Is that going to make you less competitive in the work world? In other words, what if you want to be feminine and soft, yet still fulfill your earning and career goals? Can that be done? And if so, how? What does that even look like? In my experience, it's not only possible, it's the only way to truly succeed if by succeed, you also include having a gratifying relationship. I'm going to assume that's what you mean, because who doesn't want that? Here are three ways to flourish as a feminine feminist. Number one, honor your feminine gifts. If you try to succeed by acting like a man, even though you don't really know how to be a man, that's going to be stressful. It's hard to succeed when you're a round peg in a square hole. You can't even be yourself. That can make you cranky and maybe even start to seem like that angry, unpleasant type of feminist we've all heard so much about. As a woman, you're going to show up differently in the workplace than a man would because you are different and that's often a benefit to your clients or to your employer. Imagine if Ella Fitzgerald had tried to sing like Louis Armstrong. She wouldn't have been able to do it very well, but she would have robbed us all of the pleasure of her gifts as a singer, which are completely different than Lewis's awesome pipes. You're different from the men at work too, and I don't just mean your size and shape. I mean you, as a woman, have unique gifts to contribute, like emotional brilliance, for example. You're better at knowing how you feel and expressing it than men are. That emotional brilliance can give you an edge in nurturing the relationships with your team, your vendors, your clients, It's a great quality for a leader to have. So instead of just acting like a smaller, curvier man, why not celebrate your own feminine strengths and use them to lead the project of the team to the finish line? Number two, stop managing when work is done. One of the best things that ever happened to me professionally was getting married. I recommend it for all working women. It gives me so many advantages in the work world, including having another great mind to help me analyze and address challenges and make good decisions. It's financial backing that helps me take more risks, a sounding board, an admirer when I feel discouraged, and hugs and kisses when everything goes kablooey. My husband also published my first book, and he shoots and edits my videos. So the list of extraordinary benefits goes on and on. But before I realized I had feminine gifts, being married didn't seem that advantageous professionally. And that's because my husband seemed hostile and distant most of the time. And the problem was that I was trying to manage my husband like a project or a team member at work. And husbands don't like to be managed. They resist it mightily, in my experience. So learning to turn off managerial Laura when the working day was done and put on my soft feminine hat when I was with my husband was incredibly helpful for me personally and professionally. It restored the connection in my marriage, which resulted in me showing up for my work with so much more to give because I stopped wasting all my energy on a struggling relationship. Shortly after I had gotten the hang of changing my hat, 
I became a New York Times bestselling author and an international bestselling author. I went on national TV shows like Dateline, Today, The View, Good Morning America, and international TV shows as well. And that's how much it helped me professionally to take off my work hat when the working day was done. Number three, express your desires instead of being assertive or complaining. When Sheryl Sandberg famously told everyone they should stop calling little girls bossy because it would inhibit them from asserting themselves as leaders in the future, I just winced. First of all, I don't like being told what to do. So even if it's about not calling people names, who does like being told what to do? It also sounded a lot like a complaint, and it implied that telling other people what to do has something to do with leadership. It doesn't. Nobody is inspiring when they complain or tell you what to do. Sorry, Cheryl. The most effective way to get a group of people to work vigorously toward a common goal is with inspiration. One great way to inspire people is by tapping into your desires and expressing them purely with no criticism, no control, no complaining. And since desire is the seed of feminine power, learning to express your desires in a way that inspires those around you could just change the world. Here's what I mean. Assertiveness says, I've been waiting for your report for over a week and it's holding up this project. I need you to get it done by tomorrow. Desire says, I'm so excited to deliver the finished project because I think the client is going to love it. Your part of the project is so valuable and I would love to see your research and recommendations. Which one is more inspiring? Being feminine at work means speaking from your desires instead of telling people what to do. A feminist might say, it's unfair that women don't make equal pay for equal work and we have to put an end to that. A feminine feminist might express a desire. I'm committed to doing a great job and I would love to make X dollars what I deserve for that work. It took a little focus at first, but once I got the hang of it, I loved how it feels to be a feminine feminist. And I think you will too. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at GetCherished.com. Go to GetCherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. My guest, Ray, was devastated that her husband was having an emotional affair with a woman from work. She insisted he break it off, and finally he did. But she wanted her husband to admit what he had done and make it up to her, and he wouldn't. Finally, the texting started again with another woman, and this time Ray made an ultimatum, and with the firm conviction that this was unacceptable. What happened next took her on a completely unexpected journey that ended with happily ever after. She's going to walk us through what she did to fix her marriage. Hello, Ray. Thank you so much for coming on the Empowered Wife podcast. Hi, Laura. Um, This is such an honor um, to to be on your podcast. Um, Thank you so much for having me. So take us back to the beginning. What was going wrong in your marriage? If you don't mind, I would like to start at the very beginning, which was about just over 20 years ago um, when, when I met my husband. Um, we, were, we were in a big group of young people and mutual friends introduced us. And he was just so handsome. He, was so, um, he had such a proud posture and he was almost noble. And he, he, when he looked at me, he looked me straight in the eye and I'm getting goosebumps remembering this. He, he would, he looked, it was like he was looking right through me, right through my soul and into the depths of my heart. And you could see everything. And I wasn't nervous. I just felt safe. I felt, it almost felt like a, that moment that we met. So that moment, it always stayed with me. And as I said, that was about 20 years ago. Yeah. And, you know, reality came back and everyday life came back after that moment, but I always remembered that moment. So there really was oh, we, we, special about your husband for you. This really was. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. No, he was awesome. 
So we got married about eight months later. And, um, well, I would say it was, was a good marriage. Um, there were ups and downs and, um, fights here and there, not, not very often. Um, my son got born uh, three years later. I had job changes and he had promotions, um, some stresses in the family. Um, but all in all, everything was, was relatively good. And then, in the beginning of 2018, he was really struggling at work. He really, really didn't like his job. And he became very depressed. Uh, he was, he was really, he, I, I just said he, he complained constantly about his job and he was really, he was, he felt trapped in his job. I thought, I thought I would help him. I encouraged him to, to talk. Every evening I would sit with a cup of tea and I would encourage him to talk and ask him questions. How does it feel? What's happening at work? And um, I don't know. It, it just it, it, didn't, it didn't seem to help at all. He just became more depressed, more distant. And then um, in the middle of 2018, he went on a, a, like a team building trip uh, three days with with some of his colleagues. And when he came back from that trip, he, he told me that he met up with one of his um, colleagues. They, before he changed his position, they were working together every day. Um, and they talked again and they really hit it off. And he realized that he really missed her. He missed her company because they used to be together all the time. And he started to pursue this friendship. After hours, not not during working hours, they talked over the phone very regularly. They texted all the time. Uh, she lives; she doesn't live close to where we live, so they met up over weekends. Yeah, and it was actually it was pretty intense. <laughs> mm. It was it was something that I wasn't wasn't used to. Um, this has never happened before, and. Um, uh, wow, <laughs> I was, I was devastated. I was so scared. Um, because it was new and it was, it, I just felt so threatened by this relationship. It was just so much, I just, I just really felt scared. I, it was really, it, it seemed to be a threat to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, here you were making this effort to be such a good listener and support. So in some ways, like what, what is he getting from her, right? That you're not providing. Yeah. And, then, and then it, it, I can definitely see where it would start to feel like you've been replaced. He's really, yes. yeah. Yes. So that's why it feels like such a big threat. Yes. Whether have this emotional connection with her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I overheard one of the telephone conversations and they were, he was flirting and joking with her and I was, I was shocked. <laughs> I was really, I was shocked. It was, it was not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> yeah. Not what I wanted to hear. Painful. Yeah. Painful. It feels like a, mm. a betrayal, um, not mm. a full blown affair, I get, but probably yeah. emotionally feels, just as bad. Yes. Um, I, I was, I was very confused. So I, on the one hand, I was, I was really, I was feeling all this pain and all this fear and all this confusion. And on the other hand, my husband was um, acting as if nothing was wrong. Um, he was really very surprised at my, at my reaction. And he was, he couldn't see that anything he was doing was wrong. And in this confusion, I really, you wouldn't, you wouldn't make me feel better. So I really just needed, um, to find some help somewhere. I, 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 um, I have an older friend who doesn't live close to us. She lives very far away in a different city. And I, I started talking to her and confiding in her. And I was a bit surprised when she became very critical of, of my husband's relationship with this colleague. And eventually, she suggested a, a trial separation, which was shocking to me. <laughs> I knew, I knew it was, it was painful, but I didn't really think it was that bad. And also, 
I searched online because, like I said, it was so painful and I, I was so confused. And I came upon this this um, very scary term, emotional affair. And every description of what an emotional affair is fitted in with, with what was happening with him. And suddenly I had an answer. Um, it's so painful because he's, he's unfaithful to me. He's having an affair. Oh. Yeah, it was, it was a very painful time for me. Really a very painful time. Um, and I didn't know what to do. It seemed, it seemed everywhere I went, the, the suggestion was to, to get a divorce. Oh. To, or to leave or a separation at least to, and that's just not what I wanted to do. Because he was, when he wasn't with her, he was really with me and really acting like my husband. Um, except we were fighting all the time because <laughs> I was, I was constantly, um, confronting him about this, this, um, this relationship of his. Um, I really, at first I tried to get him to stop seeing her and to, stop going to her and to stop talking to her. And eventually I realized that whatever I said, he was, he was going to do what he was going to do. So at least I stopped telling him to stop, <laughs> but I didn't stop wanting him to stop. And I didn't stop obsessing about it. Did it feel like at the time, like if he would just stop seeing her, then everything would be fine. Everything would be great. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it felt like that. Exactly yeah. like that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But he wasn't. He wasn't willing to stop. Well, he seemed confused too because it was it was a bit of an on off situation. He would he would break things off with her, and then a little while later they would start talking again. And um, this happened, I think, about three or four times that he, he broke off old contact and then they started again. So, yeah, he tried to please me. He tried to, he tried to, to do what I wanted, but it was almost like he couldn't. It was almost like he couldn't. Scary. Um, yeah. Very scary. And wherever I searched for help and um, advice, uh, people – Wherever I searched, people would validate me. I was the victim of a husband who was having an emotional affair. And all the advice was that he, would, he needed to stop and the two of us needed to work on it together, on our relationship together. So um, that just, it just felt so hopeless because clearly he wasn't, he wasn't going to do this. Yeah, you've already tried yeah. to ask him to do this, and mm-hmm. and you're at a dead end. It sounds like yes, yes. I felt really hopeless. I I read in an attempt to just get some some insight and some hope and some guidance. I um I bought quite a few books, um, and I joined I joined a group for um, spouses who, of. Uh, unfaithful spouses and um, I got some support and I got some some advice that that worked a little bit but um, eventually like eventually what? the well um the, this group actually said that you they said that you couldn't control your spouse you you couldn't and they also suggested that you should take care of yourself but if at any point you you reached uh, a, a place where you felt you were being damaged emotionally or spiritually, then you needed to take care of yourself by um, setting your boundaries and uh, enforcing consequences <laughs> if your boundaries weren't honored. I mean, it sounds very, very self-respecting. It um, does. It does. <laughs> and that... I just, I, just, I felt like such a coward for not, for not doing that because I, I just, I, I just couldn't get myself to, to set my boundaries and to enforce consequences. But yeah, that, those were, that were the kind of things that, the kind of 
advice that I, I listened to that, and that I got. <laughs> yeah. So, well, so, so what happened? Eventually, after about 18 months of this, this uh, relationship on and off, he ended the, the relationship. They stopped talking. And um, that was in November of, of 2019. So it kind um, of ran its course, would you say? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, um, I think it ran its course, and um, it's very strange. But my problems were not solved in that moment when <laughs> I stopped talking. I was still um, most of the time I would be okay, but every now and again, like some trigger, something would trigger me. Um, like I would remember this. This time exactly a year ago, this and this and this happened. Or um, one of my colleagues would mention uh, a restaurant that his wife loves that he took her for their anniversary. And that would be the exact same ha- a restaurant that my husband took me for my birthday and two months later took her for a romantic, well, I thought it was a romantic dinner. And they were just Everywhere there were these painful reminders of what happened in the past. Um, I just, it's like that. I just couldn't get away from it. I couldn't escape these painful memories. Um, and whenever something like that happened, I would kind of just reminisce and go back to my diary and read through all the things that I wrote and how painful it was. Um, and I would just, bathe myself in all these hurtful memories I I expected him to to fix me I expected him to make it up to me he did this to me it was his job to to make me happy again <laughs> did it feel kind of like you had no choice but to go visit those painful memories and read through them again yeah I think so I thought that um Ignoring them would, would be stuffing them down. And then at some point they would, they would kind of brew and bubble and just explode out of me. Um, that was the kind of thing I thought would happen if I, if I just, if I just try to get them out of my mind. Um, so yeah. Yeah. So you you continue to feel um, mm. sad and hurt and scared, it sounds like, even though yeah. the relationship mm. ended. So your marriage is not feeling whole yet. No, no not at all, no. Um, and also I was walking around with that, that knowledge that my husband had been unfaithful to me. He had, he had had an emotional affair. Every source that I consulted confirmed the fact that what what happened between him and that other woman was an emotional affair, and um, if he if he couldn't see that that uh, that what he what he had done was wrong, then how could he fix me, and how could he fix our relationship? So I I had all those memories. Plus, I had this. It's almost like a sword hanging over our our relationship that it might happen again, or. That something was wrong. Why? Why did this happen this way? <laughs> so there's really no um, chance of it ever being whole again because he couldn't see. He, he yes, couldn't. He, he didn't see it. <laughs> so then, then what happened? Well, um, the moment I, I thought that this this was really we really really can't go on like this anymore was um, he went on another work trip and while he was there um i saw a payment go through on our joint credit card the the text came through and it was for an for an app and when he came home from that trip um, i noticed he was on his phone a lot and there were some funny notifications coming through and i found out that he had uh joined a dating app and to me, that was just proof that he was he was looking for someone else, and that he wasn't committed to our marriage to our marriage anymore. So yeah, this this was that moment where I had to state my boundaries and enforce the consequences. 
Mm-hmm. You got up the gumption to do that finally. It sounds like. mm-hmm. Yeah, I just thought it was this was the low point, and um, nothing can be worse than this. <laughs> I was, I was so frightened um, when I saw that. When I found out he was, he was talking, he was on the dating app, and so I got up the courage to to talk to him about it. Um, and I stated my boundaries. I told him this was just too much. <laughs> this was just too painful. I couldn't watch him on the dating app, sitting in my house, being busy on the dating app, looking for someone else. And I said to him that either, either he, he, he deleted this app and he deleted all the numbers of all the women that he was talking to. And I wanted him to make his phone available to me and his, his tablet available to me at any time. I would be able to see his messages at any time, his emails, his photos. And he would stop this. Um, and if he didn't agree to, to this boundary of mine, then I'm going to ask him to leave because I couldn't watch him do this day in and day out, wanted him to leave. Been a very rough day, very hard conversation. It was a very hard conversation. Yes. Yeah. How did he respond? He he didn't respond immediately, um, but he came back to me about two days later with his own ultimatum, because that's what that's what boundaries are. It's an ultimatum. Um, he came back with his own ultimatum. Um, he said to me that we could divorce. And when he said that word divorce, I really was, uh, it, I re- it took me as a shock because I didn't ask him to divorce me, but actually, actually I did. <laughs> so he said we could, we could get divorced. It would be an easy divorce because of laws here and, and the way we got married. Um, and he said he just wanted this and this and this. It could be resolved within two weeks. Or I could take back what I said and he would be my husband and he would be a father to our son and he would continue with his friendship. Um, yeah. So that was, that was his response. But he also said something else. <laughs> Um, which, which also struck me as a big surprise. He said to me that he had read every single one of my relationships books, relationship books. He had read every single one, but there's one book that I must read. And he said uh, the book about the six skills and his words were that woman really understands me. And that was your book, Laura. That was the empowered wife. I hadn't started reading it yet. Uh, it was next on my list to read. I was was just finishing up with another book, um, and he'd read it before I did. In in a way, I was devastated that my husband and I were talking about divorce, and that wasn't my intention at all. Um, but on the other hand, he was giving me hope. He was saying that he wanted to be a husband to me, he wanted to be a father to our son, and he was giving me a hope by, by pointing me in a direction where I could find some help. So that was my crossroads. <laughs> yeah. It's been, and I started reading. It must have felt like a punch on that day, though. It must have just felt like an incredible shock. No, I was floating. I wasn't in reality. <laughs> I wasn't, I didn't really know what was going on around me. I just knew, I just knew I had to, I had to read this book. <laughs> I, read, I had to read The Empowered Wife. And I started reading it straight away. So you're reading this with uh, some veracity, like your life depended on it, right? Because I, you had written that at one point. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah. what did you... What did you start to do differently than what you had been doing after reading it? Um, so after 
just getting getting acquainted with all the knowledge and um I also looked up some of your um programs and I decided a, a week after I read the book I joined the ridiculously happy wife program so while all of this was happening he was getting better acquainted with with his new friend and it scared the living daylights out of me I was it was the most scary thing I had to do was to, I had to relinquish control of this relationship that I had to. It was, it was, um, it wasn't something I chose. I couldn't pick and choose the one, which one of the skills I had to relinquish control. Um, in your, in that chapter, you, you, uh, you list those four questions that one should ask yourself when you feel the urge to control. The first one is, uh, what am I afraid of? So I was afraid that I was going to lose my husband. The second question was, okay. is my fear realistic? Ah. Um, and I thought it was realistic. I thought it was pretty realistic. <laughs> uh, the third question was, was I really able to control this? And um, I really had to tell myself, no, I couldn't. I couldn't, I couldn't control this. Um, and the fourth question is, is it worth the loss of intimacy to try and do something. Um, and I'd seen what it had done to our relationship um, with a previous friend. And uh, I just I just had to – I had those questions on repeat in my head because I really just didn't want this to happen. So I really had to train myself to let go, let go. Along with that – I realized I wasn't very respectful. I, I feel that relinquishing control and um, respect, they actually go hand in hand. Um, and it's, it's very strange. Um, I always thought I really respected my husband because I always admired him and I always thought that he was really clever and capable. But the way your book describes respect to a man, I realized that, that I was very subtly criticizing with the with the comments I made and the questions. Um often often when he talked, I would I would start a line of questioning either to prove something that I had in my mind or to prove him wrong or you know. I was I was very good with my questions <laughs> and my subtle comments. I wasn't a, a very directly in, a disrespectful wife. I was a very subtle disrespectful wife, and I I I, I hid it actually to myself as well. I, I it took me a while to to realize that I was disrespectful. What I love about your work, Laura, is it's so very very practical. It's very practical to use the tools. So. Um, when I when he was saying something about about her or about their relationship, I knew to either keep quiet to put duct tape over my mouth, or I knew to just say mm-hmm, aha, or maybe I hear you, and that that helped me through a lot, through a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> that must have taken a lot of courage to just listen. Um, yeah. No, it was. It was, it was difficult. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, and uh, I so I love your the way you bust yourself on the series of uh, questions. They were just questions, right? Because I just really. <laughs> so, I'm not gonna, I'm just asking a question, right? <laughs> was yeah. so, but but you saw yourself. You saw this control so clearly, and you are now making a different choice. You're saying, "I hear you," mm-hmm. uh, or just duct tape. It was actually quite amazing. Two weeks after I read your book, he met up with her. So he met up with her about a week after I read the book. But he went, took her to dinner two two nights in a row. She came over to our city for a few days, um, and actually the next week she she had another something else, some other business in in town, and she came uh, and he took her to dinner again. Um, that was that was on a Monday. And on on the Wednesday, just over two weeks after I read the book, he came to me and he said to me, I don't want to be pals with that woman anymore. <laughs> and um, it always before, 
it would it would say her name and she would it would kind of be very soft about her and I, she was she was in a way he admired her but after that third time they were together um he said he called her that woman <laughs> so he to his self diary the book he he stopped talking to her <laughs> so i was I was elated. I was so happy. <laughs> and um I was I was very thankful for for the skills and I was very thankful for the book. Um and I continued to practice to practice the skills as best I could. But um and we had we had I think we had about four weeks of, of bliss. It was um our relationship was just wonderful. We were talking, we were laughing we we were physically close um everything was just wonderful for about four weeks um i mean a lot of things started to happen it was um at the end of march so uh, this covid pandemic um hit our country as well and we had to we had very strict lockdown rules there were some financial issues there were some issues in the house and all these things seem to happen at once and um somehow our relationship just started to to crumble again um he just started being distant and critical and cold and um i i didn't understand what was going on yeah and i i kind of um redoubled my efforts with with the skills um I would lie in bed at night and, and list the six intimacy skills, self-care, relinquishing control, respect, receiving, uh, gratitude and vulnerability. I would just list these six in my head and then I would think, how could I do this better today? Mm-hmm. And I would really, really do them and, um, he would just, he would just not respond or he would say, it would be very critical of me. Once I, um, I said thank you and um, I really appreciate that. And he said, I don't care what you appreciate. And there was another time I was smiling at him. Um, I, I wanted to do a smile campaign. <laughs> and he asked me, why are you grinning at me like that? And I, I just didn't know what I was doing wrong. I was doing the six intimacy skills as best I could. And he was he was just getting further and further away from me and colder and colder and more critical. I couldn't see what was going on. And then some, probably some more hopelessness came up for you. Because yes. Of, oh, this is These skills aren't working either. So now no. I'm really in trouble. Wow. So what did yeah. um, Well, when, when I had my initial, initial success, I was, I was very proud of myself and I thought, I've got these skills. I know exactly what to do. I'm going to teach other women. I'm going to do coach training. So that was in March. I'm in, well, April. I enrolled for the June, the June group. End of June, we started with coach training. And um, by the time we started coach training, I remember writing coach Darlene uh, an email saying, I don't know if I can do this. Um, how can I tell other women how to have a happy marriage when this is going on with me? And she, she was, she was so sweet. She just said that, don't worry. You, you've got this. This, it's, it's going to be fine. So coach training started. Um, and I started having private coaching, private coaching calls. And, um, just one by one, my blind spots got exposed. And I think the, the first and the most important blind spot that eventually it took, it was a process of, of realization. But finally, after a few weeks, I realized that it doesn't matter what the tool is that you use. Control is still control. <laughs> if you use Laura Doyle's tools, intimacy tools, to control your husband, then he's going to feel controlled and you're not going to have intimacy. So I realized I was using 
the skills, I was using them to control my husband. And that's why it wasn't working. So what I needed to do was to look at myself and to apply the tools to me so that I could change. You have that concept in your book of, of, um, of being on your own paper. Um, like in school when children do their homework and you would look at the, the girl next to you, the paper, her paper and to see if she was doing it all right. It's almost like I see it, I see it very much as, as like coloring in and you go and take your pencil and start coloring on, on her paper because she's not doing it right. <laughs> so my coach for the first two sessions, she constantly pulled me back onto my own paper. So that was that was the biggest blind spot was the skills were for me. I had to change myself and not not use them to manipulate my husband. Well, I love this story so much, Ray, because first of all, I I too I just wanted to know how to make my husband do what I wanted. That's how I yes. And that seemed, and then, and I also started practicing, you know, with that in mind and not having a concept of the skills being for me. So, and I think it's very common that, and so many women will say, the skills aren't, they don't work for me. My husband's not responding. This doesn't work for me. So it's, anyway, you did just this beautiful job of describing that, that awful process of feeling like, you see, I've done everything now and he's not responding. And then, and then. Actually, and it was, it was kind of a painful moment for me. I remember realizing like, oh, it's me. I'm the one. I'm still controlling. I'm still. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, I love, I, love, I love that story. So, so you had this breakthrough, this awareness. Oh, I'm still, I'm still in control. I'm trying to control. So mm. how did you, how did you address that? What did you do different? Oh, well, self-care is important. I think everyone on the podcast talks about self-care. Um, and the thing with me is I, I actually have quite a comfortable life. I've had a comfortable life for a while now. Um, I have my, I, I have someone who cleans my house, so I don't need to worry about that. Um, my, I, I really, I really have a comfortable life. I, I go, I go to do my nails. I, I, I have a wonderful hairdresser. Um, I have some time to, for myself because my son is already he's, he's 60 now, so he doesn't need me that much. And I I noticed that that before I knew the skills, I would go to the hairdresser um, and it would be a three-hour long affair. And my husband would say to me, go and enjoy your time at the hairdresser. And I would say, oh, it's three hours that I have to sit, just sit there. Um, and yeah, they, they did a hand massage and they gave me cappuccino. But, I mean, it's three hours that I have to sit there. It's <laughs> so, awful. So the, it's awful. <laughs> <laughs> so with, um, with the intimacy skills, I, I, read, I read things I'd watch and I also read things you can well get as good as you can stand, your other book. Um, so I realized that this concept of what you focus on increases. So I started focusing on the the good stuff. So after the skills, when I went to the hairdresser, I would tell myself, I'm going to enjoy this. You know, when you get in there, they've got this little picture frame with just glass, and then they would write a message, a welcome message to you. Welcome, Ray, blah, blah, blah. Um <laughs> And they would bring you a cappuccino. And if you wanted water, they would bring you water. And um, and before COVID, we could get a meal as well. Um, and I just started really enjoying and really receiving all the wonderful pampering that they would give me. Mm. Um, so these three hours just became a little piece of heaven. <laughs> and when I came home, I, I looked and I felt wonderful. So self-care for me wasn't to make time for myself. It was to notice the wonderful things, to just re, just change my focus to see the, the good things in life. Another, another, uh, example is, is, is gardening. Um, 
I would I would work in the garden. I would have some um, goals, and then when everybody else, my husband and son, also did their garden work at the same time, and then when they were finished, and I still had some stuff to do, I would really start feeling sorry for myself <laughs> in the past. So when I do my garden, I just do what I enjoy, and I just enjoy the lovely plants, the birds, the sunshine. Um, and take in the fresh air and listen to the birds and look at what 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 I was creating and just enjoy it. So, so I think what what I'm trying to say is that for me, self care wasn't um, taking more time for myself. It was shifting my perception and enjoying and allowing myself care to nourish me. Amazing! Yeah. So, I love this because. You didn't change the activities you were doing. You just changed the, your, the way you were yes. doing those activities. And they have they become more enjoyable now? It sounds like they have. Much more enjoyable. Much more, yes. Um, even showering, something simple like showering or putting on makeup. <laughs> I've, I've, um, it's my self-care now. Um, over weekends, I take more time and I put on more makeup than <laughs> in the week. Uh, because I just love doing it. <laughs> feels good. It feels fun. Yeah. I love that. Okay, so now so so you've you're focusing more on enjoying your life, your comfortable life, and you're more aware of your um the control that was kind of uh, mm-hmm. underneath. And how did your how did this change the culture at your house? So when my husband became cold and distant, he became really um, physically very distant. Um, there were no kissing. There was no kissing. There was no hugging. There was just the bare minimum. Um, he would just, just like with this pick on the mouth when he left for work and when he came home. Um, there was just really the bare minimum. What what was there before was even less than before all this. While he was busy with with his friendship, there was much more physical affection than than now. When uh, at the beginning of coach training, so that was very painful, um, and I had to get out of that out of that ditch. So, what I did was to focus on what was really going right. So I would look for signs that my husband was committed to the relationship and that he loved me because in the past, the physical affection was my, was my sign. And now that was gone. So I had to find some evidence that he was still, that he still loved me and that he still was in the relationship. So I started with, with basic things. He was working to earn an income to support our family, three of us. Um, I also work, but I mean, it was for us. Um, he was, he was coming home every, every evening. He was spending his weekends with, at home with me and my son. He was taking care of the house, uh, fixing things that were broken. He was taking care of the yard. He has this habit of every week, looking at my car, um, at the tires and the oil and everything, just to make sure my car is still safe. And all of these, and, and he also is, he takes care of our finances. He, he, I don't need to do any financial planning or anything. I, I don't even know how much money I have in my bank account <laughs> at the moment. So um, I just started focusing on all these things. And also... I had I had a little boo boo with a gratitude in the in the in the past, um, so I had to really feel grateful before I said thank you to him for something. Um, so I really made sure that it was super sincere when I when I said thank you. So I focused on all these things that were going right. And you recommend three gratitudes a day. Um, I didn't necessarily say them all to him. I, I, I journaled them and I felt them. And whenever I had the, the chance to authentically and sincerely say them to him, I would say them. Yeah, so I think that was the big turning point, was just to focus on what was going right. 
and pretty soon um, some more things started popping up. <laughs> yeah, so then you had even more to be grateful for when she started. Yes. And so, and he had been, he had responded badly. I don't care what you're grateful for before. Yes. Now, I I don't know. I I still felt that he was he was being critical, even though my I was changing. He, I, you know, I could see day by day. I could see very gradually that he softened, and also I think when I started changing my perspective and um, doing the skills for me, I started hearing him better. I felt he was very critical at some time at some stage and um he used to say to me every weekend when he checked my car he would tell me you you had driven over a curb again because he could see the the marks on the on the sides of the of the tires and I took that as criticism you can't drive you 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 are um, ruining your car but when I started looking for, when I started noticing um, all the good things that he does and that he really cared about me, I realized that this was a habit. I had I had recently got gotten a, a bigger car, um, and since I've been driving the bigger car, I, I was wasn't taking my turns wide enough, and I was damaging the tires. And this was dangerous <laughs> because the side of the tire is is a weak spot. And if I didn't change my habit, um, my tire could blow while I was driving. So actually what I heard as criticism wasn't criticism. He was, he was trying to tell me, change your behavior. You're not being safe. He was, he was actually caring about me. Protecting I, all I, Yeah, protecting me. That's, yes, exactly that. But all I could hear was criticism before and now – now I could see what he was actually saying. He wasn't criticizing me. So when the the following weekend after I noticed this, when he was saying that again, I actually said to him, you know, thank you so much for checking my car for safety and thank you so much for pointing out to me my dangerous behavior. And he he was so appreciative of that of that gratitude because he felt that I could see. <laughs> I could see him and I could hear what he was talking about. His heart. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Well, what is your relationship like now? Um, yeah, you said you said that just now. I could hear his heart. Um, so I'm hearing a lot more heart messages because um when when he talks um about things that, that are realizations and things that that he's interested in in the past when he said certain things i would take it personally and i would come back with some kind of subtle criticism these days when he says these things i could re- i can really listen and i can i can really hear his heart message underneath i am a lot less sensitive these days so um and he's a lot less He's a lot calmer. He, he, he speaks. Um, he speaks more freely, um, and he speaks about subjects that he, in the past, probably wouldn't have spoken about. Um, we we recently went on a short getaway for five days, um, and it was just. It was both of us were so relaxed. I I don't think that I didn't think that we were fighting a lot when we went on holidays. But I realized there, there had always been um, some discomfort, some, some tension some, at some stage, especially with the packing. Um, and, yeah, there, there would always be some something. And um, this time the packing was a breeze. Um, we just were so calm together. And, um, and he started making jokes. He started... We started making jokes, so we started having really, really having fun. And I could, and I could, yeah, in some of his jokes that he made, I could recognize that if he'd made this, if he'd said this thing um, before, I would have, I would have taken it as a criticism. But now I could, I could see it, and I could laugh, and I could tell him you're so funny. <laughs> 
I made some jokes from my side as well. So, and then, well, the, the physical warmth as we turned, we are hugs and spontaneous kisses again. He's, um, oh my gosh, my birthday present. <laughs> If we have time, can I tell you about my birthday present? Yes, yes, I insist that you tell us about your birthday present. <laughs> this was just on the brink of my breakthrough, my personal inside breakthrough. Um, it was it was my birthday, the end of July, um, and I actually had a coaching call with one of my class class uh, mates. Um, and I, I really wanted her to just coach me on not expecting anything. I didn't want to have any expectations because things, I feel things were still a bit tense between us and I didn't know whether he got me something or not. Um, and I got up the morning, I, I decided I wasn't going to expect anything. Um, I was going to do go about my, my normal routine and that would be to go jogging. Um, oh, of course, five in the morning. <laughs> and um, I got up and I um, started getting dressed and my husband said, certainly you don't want to go jogging on your birthday. I I got you a present. <laughs> and um, he took out this, this, it's like this big uh, gift gift bag um, and there was a big gray fluffy teddy bear in it with a pink ribbon very, very cute. And I took it out and it stroked its fur and I was smiling and I was happy. And he said to me, that's not your birthday present. <laughs> and um, I looked and I saw like these envelopes and papers and, and right there in the corner was a, was a jewelry box. And I opened the jewelry box and there was this amazing necklace he bought me. It had a, a big blue stone. With, with three diamonds and the whole, the, it, it, it was, it was arranged in the shape of a, a guardian angel over this big stone that looked like a blue teardrop. So to me, it was kind of the teardrop was for me like vulnerability and the guardian angel was the protection that it was almost a message of you safe with me. And it was, it's just so, so beautiful. And I've never, I've never had, he's never bought me such a, such a precious gift. It's, it, it's, it's valuable. It's unique. Um, the stone is, is, is very rare. Um, and it just made me feel so valuable, unique and rare. And I just, that, that was wonderful. But that hasn't happened before. <laughs> I never got such a present. This was um, what you wanted when he was having the emotional affair, right? When he was talking to the other yes. one, wanted to feel special and safe. Yes, <laughs> all out of his own. <laughs> all on his own, yeah. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. This is it's a, such an inspiring story, Ray. I love it. It's remarkable. Thank you. Accomplished. It's such a, a big thing. And I know that. Your view of that term emotional affair has has changed somewhat. I when I look with with my new perception at what happened in that time, um I can see how my husband was really trying to put me at ease, trying to to prove to me that he was he was my husband and I was his wife and he didn't want another wife. He was he was saying that he was doing things to prove that to me. I was the one who behaved differently towards him. I was the one who was picking the fights and um and criticizing him and blaming him all the time. Um I if if I could go back to that time, I would just kind of take myself to, on the, by the shoulders and shake myself and say, wake up, wake up, look at what you have. Look at this wonderful man, what he's doing. Look at all the things, look at all the, all the, um, the evidence that he loves you and that he's committed to this relationship, to this marriage, and that he's devoted to you. Just open your eyes the evidence don't look at the bad stuff the painful stuff just 
allow him to be an autonomous human being, give him some privacy and stop all this this criticism and all this shopping for pain. <laughs> I'm mean, such a such a shopper for pain. I I would just wallow in in all these bad memories and all this pain. Yeah. No. But but I um I I don't like the term emotional affair anymore because I don't I don't know what it means really. I actually before this podcast I went on Wikipedia to find the definition of infidelity in marriage. Um and it's 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 broad and I don't know if I can agree with this. It says it's like one of the one of the um definitions is that it's a a violation according to a subjective feeling that one's partner has violated a set of rules or norms. I mean I feel you violated me. Yes, yes. The person it's just a feeling. I feel violated and now you are unfaithful to me. I don't know if I can I don't like that. I don't know if that's fair. <laughs> you've come so far from your original view um, on this, and mm-hmm. you've been through it, so you know it but better than anybody, right? This was a definition mm-hmm. that you, um, uh, well, I guess it initially brought you some kind of comfort or structure or something that you needed mm-hmm. uh, uh, mm-hmm. at first, and now it, it doesn't serve you anymore, what I'm hearing. Mm-hmm. No. What's your advice for a woman who is in exactly that situation where she feels that um, he is having an emotional affair, that she he has been an been infidelity because she feels there's been infidelity? Mm. Yeah. I would ask her to look carefully at 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 her life and at her at her relationship. And I would ask her, was there any proof that your husband is committed to your marriage and is committed to you? I would really ask her to look, to look at that, to just go and, and search for the evidence that, that her husband is committed to her and to, to their marriage. And then the other thing, I haven't touched on this in the rest of the, the interview yet, but the other thing, the other saving grace for me are your two grounding questions. How do I feel and what do I want? Um, and it's, it's a bit of a, it takes a bit of practice because um, if I feel scared and lonely in the past, I would look to people around me to make me feel better. But the skill to cultivate is just to find how I could make myself, how I could save myself in that situation. So if a woman's husband, if she says her husband is having an emotional affair and she's scared that she's going to lose him, I would advise it, well, I would suggest, I would invite <laughs> to um, to go look for the evidence that it is what she wants it to be. She wants it to be a safe, secure marriage. And she should also examine her own feelings and um, try to do for herself what she needs so that she could feel different and show up differently. Um. So this is, I mean, you have walked this path. You've been in tremendous pain. And uh, Mm -hmm. so I feel that your expertise is uh, unassailable here. There's laughter, there's deep conversation, the passion is back um, mm-hmm. in the wake of having gone through this crisis that you went through. So congratulations on all you've created in your marriage, Ray. It is just remarkable, and I'm so grateful that you shared it with us today. Oh, thank you, Lou. Thank you, Sam. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at GetCherished.com. Go to GetCherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. 
And now it's time for the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award. It's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice. Yeah, it's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week. And the advice that's horrifying me this week is from a blog commenter who says that she read online that you should ask for and schedule the sex you want. Because what could be hotter than getting out your calendar app and blocking out time for intercourse, right? I remember the same thing happened over here when I announced that it was time to have sex. He was more interested in watching old TV show reruns than he was in making love to me when I took that approach. Here's what the blog reader wrote about her experience with this. Quote, we had just become intimate again after a long break and it seemed like back to kind of normal. And I stupidly read couples advice online that you should ask and schedule the sex you want. I announced this to him and he looked at me like I had stabbed him and he refused to speak. And now it's a silent, awkward chasm. He now barely cuddles me. Everything else seems so much better since I followed the skills. Now, this problem feels impossible to fix. Oh, I hear ya. But instead of thinking you were stupid, though, I'd like to say that this advice you read was truly dreadful and that you're not alone in falling for it, trying it, thinking that you were doing something good. They probably framed it as taking care of your needs. Blech. If no one's ever shown you the intimacy skills, it's easy to mistakenly think some of the tripe you read is insightful and wise, especially if it comes from a source that sounds credible. Terrible relationship advice abounds, and it often does harm to women, and to couples, and to families. I can't stand hearing about that. And clearly, it caused some real damage, some real pain here. But... What's so lousy about asking for and scheduling sex, you might wonder? Why wouldn't any husband be glad to get that on the schedule since men like and want sex so much? Well, husbands are geniuses at knowing when we're trying to control them. And there's nothing more controlling than trying to schedule sex as if you're trying to get a last minute appointment with an accountant during tax season. Insisting, demanding, or even if you're just suggesting that you schedule sexy time has the undeniable subtext that you're afraid he won't make time for you otherwise, which just isn't very appealing. It's also evidence that you don't think he's going to love you that way, which is downright offensive. Best case scenario, he agrees to add sex to his list of chores, right between take out the trash and fix the toilet. That's not where you want your lovemaking to live in his mind. Scheduling sex is never as fun as being an irresistible magnet to him. It's never going to come close to the thrill of feeling desired, which is how you feel when you practice the intimacy skills. But I've never seen anybody get there with a calendar. And for that reason, the advice to ask for and schedule the sex you want is the very worst relationship advice I've heard all week. Listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife podcast. Next week, we'll talk about three steps to end the exhausting tug of war forever. In the meantime, I hope you're having lots of fun. Today's fun fact is that as long as I don't sit on the couch and eat cookies during my Zoom workout, I figure I'm nailing this. 